Hello, everybody. Welcome back to A Few Minutes of History. My name is Jake, and today I am joined by my very good friend and now long-term collaborator, Michael Stroud. Michael, welcome back. Glad to be be here, Jake. It's been, been a while. It certainly has. I and mean, we spoke off camera then, didn't we, about you know how yeah. long it's been. And it, it is great to have you back on. And we're going to be tackling a subject today, which, uh, like I mentioned to you, my knowledge is limited, probably to say the least. And it's a topic that I've I've really wanted to delve into for a long time, and I thought, who better to get on than you? And we'll be talking about the American Civil War. Now, the plan, <laughs> as all good plans are, before before we actually get stuck into it, is to break this into three parts. So today, we'll be focusing on the prelude, so the beginning and why the American Civil War started. The next episode will be on the war itself, which probably will take a lot longer because, you know, four years. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Uh, the last episode will be wrapping it all up, what happened afterwards and um, making America, you know, today. But Michael, today, obviously, like I said, the prelude to war. But before we start that, how did you, I mean, as an American, I imagine it was probably quite easy, but how did you come into, you know, being such a, 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 a great researcher and being so interested in the Civil War? The Civil War is, it's it's a huge part of our educational system from a very early age here because it's very much a defining mo- moment in who we are. So it gets a lot of uh, face time, as we'll say, in our educational system from grade school all the way up. And it's obviously distilled down to just some basic components, but it's there to kind of spark your interest. And that's what it did for for me. It's like, wow, what was this really about? And it piqued my interest. So I, I dug in a lot of my own. Um, and just um, and I was able to visit battle sites, which are about six to eight hours away from where I live. But in, I, I wanted to really go to where these things were occurring. So I've been to G- Gettysburg a n- number of times. I've been to Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania Courthouse, Antietam, a lot of the key sites, because it really brings it to life when you read about it on paper. But then you're walking the actual hills and getting a feeling for the, the ground and what those soldiers dealt with when they were in wool uniforms and its humidity is just horrendous and, and the smoke and the, all the sounds and everything, you could almost kind of immerse yourself in that. And that to me is critical because then it, it really, it spurs you on to want to learn even more about the experience, the individuals in there, what was going through their mind, both on a small level, but then being able to put it in context for the bigger picture. What were the objectives, the campaigns, the thoughts, so for me, it really starts with the individual and it goes to the bigger spectrum as well. Um, plus, as I've gotten older, I've done research in my family history and I have three ancestors that fought on the Civil War, one in the in the north who's actually buried two hours away, which I just found that out a few year, years ago. And then I have two other ones that fought for the Confederacy. One was a cavalry um, with um, a, um, a gr- guerrilla group, actually, and I just found that out of late. And then another one was in the Tennessee Infantry, actually. So it's a personal connection. So that just makes it real. Is that is that why you think the Civil War gets so much focus put on it for America? Because there is such a personal connection with so many people. You know, like you said, so many people can trace ancestors back to the war. So do you think that's why, you know, there is such a massive focus on it? Absolutely. Um, that absolutely is because the millions of people – that were involved in one form or another, their ancestors. It's it's almost hard to find somebody that doesn't have a connection to an ancestor in the Civil War. And that really speaks a lot to society because the further a society moves away from connections to military ser- service, you start to see mm. more of a disconnect, we'll say, between national identity and su- supporting the culture that you're in. Um, so there's still that strong bonding of service and which has run through my family as well my family service in america runs from the revolutionary war where i have an ancestor that fought in the virginia militia and i just found out recently they went further i have ancestors that were burgesses in the 1600s so even before i just found that out like in the last few weeks as i did some more work so i'm like wow so it just continues on Um, And that just that absolutely is a national identity and a defining moment as to who we are. Mm. So what what is the 
state of America like before the Civil War? We'll talk, you know, obviously after the revolution, sure. yeah. after uh, after us English, are, uh, British are kicked out, and you know, you you are standing on your own two feet. Right. <laughs> what what is a what is America at that point? Because it's not obviously the America we know now with the, the 50 plus states, you know, it yeah. is a very different time, isn't it? So yeah. what is the state of America like at that point? Well, you know, ironically, the, the socio political and socioeconomic factors that really drove the civil war really began before the end of the revolution, actually. And, and really between 1777 and 1804, the Northeastern states, especially were passing laws and different things to mitigate and begin to abolish slavery even then. When it really comes down to, though, is the southern colonies that became the southern states were still very much married, if you will, to the centralized British system of consolidated central control. What does that mean? That means that the economic well-being and welfare of the more of the southern states were consolidated into the hands of the few which would grow to become the plantation owners. In the North, it was becoming more industrialized. So the early beginnings were occurring there from an economic perspective. But the Northern states, starting with New York, were passing laws early on to to begin to um, free um, enslaved people and to open up avenues for them to not be in bondage anymore. So it started really early on. Those are the beginnings of it. And it only grew as other territories were looking to become states. So they even they would mold that more into their constitutions, even, which was quite interesting. Um, I kind of wanted to look at a couple of points. There were three states in particular, like Ohio, Indiana and Illinois, that when they were becoming states, there were some restrictions put on them as to their populations could be increased by by the acquisition of slaves. So that was already restrictions put on them there. The second point is it became a societal issue already early on, a divide between the North and the South as to slavery becoming um, politically linked to oppression. Um, Mm -hmm. So in tyranny. So the North was already early on making a, a distinct divide between them and their Southern counterparts about this is this is not who we are. We just fought a war you know, to be free, but why are we still fostering enslaved people? That doesn't make any sense. Um, Now, let me preface that. It still took some time for even the Northern states to completely abolish that, but the impetus was there and it was already being vocally spoken to in papers and oratories and everything. The third component was in states like Indiana, their constitution had uh, specific components in it. So Indiana's constitution in 1816 was very, um, it it declared the holding of any part of human creation and slavery or involuntary servitude can only originate in usurpation and tyranny. So the Northern states, as they were created, were becoming very anti-slavery and they wanted it ingrained in their creation, even in their constitution. So that was already becoming a political and moral issue already by the early 1800s. And um, so that right there speaks volumes as to where the divide is going already. Interesting. So, you know, like you said, there was already that split between the two years before the war even, you know, was being spoken about. Yeah. So how 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 did things then start to to, to escalate into, you know, the Confederacy and, and the, the, the wanting to break away from you know, the United States was there. You know, was that spoken about from from early on as well, or you know, was it was that a, a more a, a later thing? That was definitely more of a an evolution um, because Southern politicians were lobbying in Washington for, as they saw it, as freedom to live how they were. They felt that we had already got rid of one dictator, King George, and the British. But now they felt like the federal government, as the decades went in the 1800s, were becoming just as oppressive and everything they could not do. Now, keep in mind, the differences between the North and the South at that point were evolving more and more to a free labor society up North, while the real economic control 
was consolidating even more to plantation owners. What a lot of people tend to lose sight of is that the average Southerner was extremely poor. Mm -hmm. Like average white Southerner was very poor. They usually were indentured servants almost to the plantation owners as well. So, um, and as the decades went, and it became worse when the United States outlawed the importation of slaves. That really was kind of lighting the match to what was become the explosion of the Civil War, because then the South really felt like, well, how are we going to make money? Our livelihood is based on slave labor to work these fields. So that really was the, that really started to up the ante, as we'll say, when that occurred. Um that happened early in the 1800s. And so what that did is that restricted uh, slave ownership to just the slaves that were already here. Hmm. So that became a big business, unfortunately, within the, sl- within the slave- slaveholding states. While the North was continuing to industrialize, the average, the average person that worked was coming more out of the home. Because up to that point in the United States, a lot we were agrarian based. So a lot of people were at home, but as the North put more of their resources into industrialization, the man would leave the house more and more to do business, to go to work. The lady would be the, would generate and take care of things around the home, maintaining um, a proper homestead and doing the valuable things that had to occur there. So industrialization was occurring, but in the South, it was still agrarian based and it's Mm. driven by tobacco and rice. And so they needed, they felt they needed slave labor in order to generate their income because it was almost wholly based on that. Wasn't there a lot of, with the constitution, a lot of, um, the phrase this, it left a lot open to interpretation as well, didn't it? You know, all men are created equal, but you know, property and things like, you know, you can keep your property. And, and didn't a lot of the, the Southerners believe that, you know, that implied that, you know, their slaves were their property, so they were entitled to keep them and entitled to work them and entitled to buy them. Whereas, you know, in the North, they interpreted all men are created equal as, well, you know, we are all one human. So, you know, I I mean, even from the Constitution, there was so much, you know, ambiguity really, isn't there, that... (laughs) You know, that's I guess the, at the time, I guess at the time they all, you know, everyone, was, well, we're right. No, we're right. So I, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like now. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's an excellent point that that topic comes up a lot to this day for discussion. Um, mm. Currently, um, our state of Texas, every so many years, tries to pass a referendum to succeed from the United States, even now. Um, But it's constitutionally been determined through the Supreme Court, even early on, as well as generations after that, that is unconstitutional because of the the phrasing in the Constitution itself, the perpetuity, the perpetual nature of the United States, that it's never ending. So it's to go on forever. There's different phrases that have been interpreted and legally supported that make succession illegal. The only way a state can legally succeed is if the is if the federal government and the houses of congress basically allow it they would all have to vote to allow that but it it's really contradictory to the spirit and the nature of what the constitution was created to do and that's to bind to bind peoples together for the greater good and that yeah. and so that's why it makes it null and void even though they presented arguments at the time speaking to the other end, because in their opinion, when the uh, politicians um, in South Carolina, who was the first state to succeed in 1860, in December of 1860, their feeling was, we're being oppressed, we're, we're basically fighting a second revolutionary war, and that's what some of it referred to as a second revolution, that we traded King George now for Abraham Lincoln, because they felt he was going to be too oppressive to their well-being, so they pulled mm-hmm. out first. Now, South Carolina was the strongest, most vehement slaveholding state. So they really saw it as a direct attack on their livelihood. And they they felt it was in their right based on how they construed the arguments and the the information to justify it. Interesting. So so who were the other states then that that, um, seceded with South Carolina? Um, 
Well, South Carolina was was first, and then it became mm. kind of like a domino effect over a period of mm. time. I mean, you would lose um, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama. They would start to domino effect after, but South Carolina took the lead. Um, other states like Virginia actually took took a while, relatively speaking, before they succeeded. Um, and then Tennessee became contentious, so they had basically half the state wanted to be um, – free and the other half didn't. So that was a major area of contention just within the state itself. And then kind of going back to Virginia, Virginia actually was bigger than it is now because it included then what was West Virginia now. Mm. Um, so, and that was, so that split as well, eventually because of the Northern sympathizers were more on West Virginia and Virginia state itself stayed more pro South. Um, so there were different, do, it's like a domino effect. What, wasn't there some some sort of buffer states in the middle as well that were you know a, a, bit, a bit unsure of what to do? I guess yep. the buffer zone is probably the correct term to to say that. So how did how did all this affect them? Because I know you mentioned there that some states were very yeah. split fifty fifty. Yep. So what was what was it like for those states at that time? Because I imagine it would have been very very you know a bit on a powder keg. You know, in a lot of ways, the 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 border states were very much like a microcosm of the greater civil war itself. The old mm. adage of brother against bro- brother, things like that. Yeah. It's t- taking that con- concept and putting it in a smaller confined space of being one state. It's very much what you're going to get. So what does that result in? That results in a lot more of um, bro- of neighbors spying on na- neighbor, different secret reports going to the south of the, the north. Um, Maryland especially was a hotbed for intrigue, as we'll say. Even D- D.C. was rife with Southern sympathizers, both in politics still after the breakup started and spies everywhere. It, it, it's amazing as to what, what occurred between uh, social ladies, as we'll say, passing information on through different avenues. That was a big pro- proponent of um, a big component, I mean, of Southern uh, of the Southern spy network actually is they had some sympathizers everywhere that were passing information b- back and forth. So like the Tennessees, the Maryland's, they were very contentious in a confined space, which would lead to outbreaks of violence a lot just between neighbors and, and people um, and those citizens um, begging for assistance from one side or the other saying, we're with you, we're, we're with you. Mm-hmm. So like, Tennessee went back and forth until finally driven out through Chattanooga and some other key battles that we'll talk, talk about down the road. That was a hotbed because you had different components, politicians and civilians saying, Hey, we're pro this. Most of the people here are like that. We need your help. So one side would say that one group of the population to the North would appeal to the North. The other would appeal to Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy saying, no, we're pro South. You know, we need your assistance. So it became contested until until there were d- definitive battlefield actions that put it to bed. And even after mm. that, there were, had to be governors. They had to appoint military governors with a substantial force to basically enforce law and order even after, because there was still a significant population that felt otherwise about the current ownership, we'll say. <laughs> did did the, the South ever look to Europe for assistance? That's something I've always wondered, you know, did they ever look to the British or the French and, and say, you know, do you fancy uh, fancy getting back what you lost? <laughs> you know what? That's an excellent point. And that was very much part of Confederate diplomacy early on. Um, actually, Great Britain was the biggest purveyor of Southern goods for the decades that led right up to the Civil War. Um, mm-hmm. At that point, uh, Great Britain was um, partaking of a lot of our cotton that was being produced in the South but also rice and some other goods. <clears throat> so the, the Confederacy banked on being able to use that as l- leverage to Great Britain to s- either to recognize their independence or mm. at least supply them with arms and money so they could fight the, the war. Because when the, when the war broke out, the South was at a distinct disadvantage in every possible way. And we'll get into yeah. that too. I don't want to get too, too far ahead of it. So, but the Confederacy early on had sent dispatched basically de- diplomats to try to get to Britain, Britain and France, both, but Britain primarily first 
because they needed the money, they needed the arms, they wanted independence recognized, and it got close a couple of times. They got very close because Britain at the time, the people were very much on the side of the North. The British people sided more with the Northern belief in how the war is wrong. We need to reunify. Yeah. Ironically, though, it was the aristocracy, the upper politicians in Britain that were more on the side of the South. So there was very much that desire to get recognition from Britain. But at least they're like, at least give us the guns and the money to fight this war. So mm. it, so Britain was really caught in a conundrum as well, because they didn't want to look like, you know, they don't want to directly look like we're fostering or fomenting a civil war that could be detrimental. But they also were like, a certain group of them were like, to your your point earlier, ah, you know, wouldn't really hurt her feelings if something fell apart. It could work out good for us. Yeah. So it was very much a a game of politics and in subterfuge that the South was trying to play to garner favor with Britain. Now, it must be said, too, that the Confederacy tried to play its hand with Great Britain to leverage their their supply of cotton to Britain as a way to, hey, you have to have our cotton, so you have to do this. Well, unfortunately, yeah. by 1861, Britain had an overabundance of stockpiled cotton because they had bought and, because they had bought and acquired so much from us already. They had more than enough. They didn't need any more. So really, the South, their production of cotton over the decades leading up to the Civil War was too good. And they actually had sold too much to Britain already. So... Britain was like, okay, your cotton's great, but we're our, but we're set. So you can't use that as try to hold over our head. So I, I think that's really interesting. So they tried to play that hand, but it kind of backfired on them when it came to really being able to force Britain's hand to make them do anything, to be honest. Yeah, I imagine, I imagine that in, in Britain at the time as well, it was almost uh, we'll, we'll back the winner sort of thing. You know, we'll see how it goes and we'll back the winner and we'll sort of, well, it will feast at the table of whoever's right. won. I imagine right. that's very much how it how it was uh, sort of played at the time as well. <laughs> um, what what was the what was the mood like in the north? I mean, you know, you mentioned Lincoln a couple of times already. Mm. What was Lincoln thinking at this time? Did he think that war was inevitable, or was he hoping that you know diplomacy would win win the day and they're all Americans, so we'll all we'll all get on over eventually. They'll get over it, sort of thing. Well, for right up until the first shots were fired at Sumter in 1861, a lot of Americans, I think, felt truly that there would be a political answer to it that we would be able to resolve it. There was just a lot of anxiety and a lot of, a lot of uh, fire branding happening with between the politicians from the North and the South that they, they really thought, and they had hoped obviously that this will get resolved. Politicians will work it out. Lincoln very much believed in the union that we are in, inviolate. We are one people. So he really, he really, really, really did not want to utilize force at all. And yeah. that really became, when it, when the Fort Sumter thing occurred, that was the flashpoint because Lincoln knew if he took the first shot, it would negate everything he had been talking about as yeah. we're not trying to steamroll over our brothers and sisters. We're trying to help them understand that this is wrong, what you're doing. We're one collective people. So he kind of, it was kind of like a, um, a, a, uh, a race with two cars headed at each other. Who's going to blink first, you know, yeah. and Lincoln was determined it wouldn't be him, but his, even it goes before that because the South was really, because Lincoln had been preaching this as well, say during his election campaign to when he was elected. So the South was the really hardcore element of the South was, and politicians were very keen on following his pro progress because his predecessor didn't really take any action. He just said, I can't do, do anything. It is what, 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 what it is. Oh, well, but Lincoln was like, this isn't right. But he was really strongly speaking out about the ills of, of what was going on and how no state should break away. We're one people. Um, he didn't really condemn slavery per se a lot at that early stage, but it was more about the protection of the union as one collective United States. So the South mm -hmm. just felt he was going to be so detrimental that if he got elected, there was no way forward for them at, driven by South Carolina first. Um, they were really 
keyed up, as we'll say, about that whole thing. So Abraham Lincoln very much wanted to avoid conflict, open conflict at all at all costs. But it really just the decision was made for him in 1861. Yeah. So you know, sort of speaking about conflict and and the two armies at the time. When when do when do the southern states start to build an army? When you know when and how is this viewed in the north? Is it seen as warmongering? You know, is it seen as a a direct attack on the on the Union or or is it you know again is it just sort of seen as ah they're just you know they're just they're, they're trying but they're not going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that entire affair is interesting on itself because the United States military at that time was less than 10,000 total mm. the country because up to that point the United States was r- really just a an effective police force for native yeah. americans and different things so we had a really minimal collective military um, from the north to the south to the west it wasn't significant at all because up to that point the revolutionary war had ended uh we fought the limited war of 1812 and it was basically just just having a, a minimum force. So no one was really prepared at all. And there wasn't necessarily a buildup. Yeah. Right? So it was basically the benefit of the West Point officers that had went through the um, West Point class of 54, I believe it was, which are the kind of like the big heads that we know of, like Lee and all of them. They were in position with the federal army. So they made decisions when conflict either became inevitable or did break out. Their loyalty was determined by each of them individually as they had more loyalty to their states than they did the union as a whole. Mm -hmm. So basically they had to create from scratch. They had to pull together what was already there. Then conscription came into place where soldiers were conscripted. So they were literally getting people out of the fields, out of their jobs. And it was usually for finite amounts of time is what would happen. Now, my contention is that the only, and we can talk about this more the next time, but the, my contention from the military perspective is the South only had one chance militarily to win. One. And it had to have been right at the very beginning. The yeah. number one reason for this is the North was a juggernaut for resources and manpower that was over twice the size of the South. The South had literally no military ability, in my opinion, to win a war that was protracted in any way because they couldn't replace their losses to the extent the North easily could. Yeah, that was that's an interesting point. It's, it's almost very Second World War with the Japanese, you know, if they didn't, you know, yeah. knock the states out instantly. Yeah. The the, the juggernaut would 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 kick into to overdrive and, and start again and you know and not be stopped. So that was another question I was going to ask was the populations of the two, you know, the Union and the and the and the, and the South. I imagine very different the South, you know, vast quantities of land, but I suppose not many people live in there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And um, what was interesting is um, by the end of 1860, um, 55% of all the slave, uh, 55% of the Southern states, the slaveholding states, more like Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, as well as South Carolina, Florida, those states had 55% of all the slaves that made up a huge chunk of their population because wow. by that point, the internal slave trade had consolidated more and they did that. That occurred because the Southern economy became driven more and more by uh, cotton and cotton by that point was the staple crop as we'll say. So those in that cotton only grows in certain environments and certain soil. So those mm-hmm. States, those, the, the climate of those States needed the most resources. So the, the plantation owners, were acquiring more of the state. So by 1860, most of the the biggest bulk of the populations of those states were actually slaves that had been acquired to run those fields. So already there's a disadvantage significantly. And that's and that made the trepidation of the South even more because the war outbreak, as the verbiage started to change and say freeing of slaves, when that start when that talk started to occur, well that really freak them out because they're like, okay, this is a problem. 55% of our population in these states are African slaves. That's a problem. <laughs> so um so that didn't help matters at all for 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 them either. So um so the populations already, as I said, were already di- di- 
we're already disparate. So at least two two to one already by the outbreak of the war, right off the bat. And actually, it's probably worse when you remove the slave populations away. Um, so um, and the South would continue to to press every person they could right up in through 1865. They were still trying to put men into the field, even at that point, which we can talk about another time. They had actually passed a a law in the South to allow African-Americans to fight on their side. But it was too little, too late, and they weren't going to get their bang for their buck at that point anyways, because a lot of the slaves are already here. And boy, we could be freed if we get away from here. We get up north. I'm not going to deal with this. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it why, was, would you, uh, why would you yeah. fight for your plantation owner? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ultimately. It, 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 yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it was already... Uh, already a, a, a horrible situation, needless to say, without needing to get in all that. So, but they were desperate by that point. The desperation yeah. was there, and they were just trying to throw anything and everything at, at the problem. But it was beyond the point of hopeless at that point. So, when does the Confederacy come around, and 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 why why does it become the Confederacy? That's always something I've always not been too too clued up on. <laughs> well, the the irony in that is that the the, cons- the when the Confederate states were formed um um in 1861 and they would continue to add the remainder of the su- southern states um the Carolinas and Arkansas and Alabama and all that. Um they based their constitution a lot on the United States Constitution which is very ironic. Um would obviously changes key changes to the phrasing that more conducive to allowing indentured servitude and slavery as a driver of their economy. And and truly that's to me, the impetus for the biggest bulk of the whole outbreak of the war anyways, that led to the Confederacy and those of like mind, because it was all economics, because to me, the economic concern for them was the overriding factor why they felt they had to break away and create their own independent country, if you will, because they felt their economic interests and their economic well-being was going to be destroyed by Abraham Lincoln in the North. Mm. Um, and more than the North, all that power was really in the hands of fewer and fewer plantation owners that consolidated more and more of the wealth and owned the bigger and bigger bulk of the slave labor. So when they felt their money and their financial well-being was at risk, they saw it as the only avenue to push back because they felt that their efforts in Congress failed. They felt the federal government was being overbearing about new laws or restrictions. They had already um, for um, had already forbidden slave trade decades before in the early 1800s, even though illegal slave trading still occurred, but it was um, that was an active effort by the federal government to stymie that with um ships at sea to stop that. So it trickled it down. It still occurred, but it, it was reduced significantly by that point. But as the decades went too, and they got closer to 1860, the plantation owners, the cost of slaves kept going up exponentially. So yeah. for them, they look at economics. I mean, I think if I remember correctly, I'm going to take a quick look at some of my information that by 1860, I, um, yeah, so in the early in the early years in the early 1800s, the cost per year for for a slave, for instance, was between 75 and 200 dollars. But um, and to put this in perspective, in the South, 75 to 200 dollars per year for a slave, free labor. If you hired somebody to do that same work, was 500 dollars. So that's why free labor wasn't a big win in the South at that point. Yeah, but even by the time the outbreak of the war. A cost of an average slave it tripled, so it was over sixteen hundred per slave at that point. So they saw it as our livelihoods being destroyed. We can afford less and less. Who's going to do the work? I can't, you know. In their mind, they're these plantation yeah. owners are like, we can't afford to hire free labor; it's too expensive. But now, our to for me to get another slave to do this work in the field, it's just as expensive or more expensive. So, what recourse do I have? And then those politicians, which usually the Southern politicians were also were also plantation owners. So the power consolidated to the few. Politician is the plantation owner a lot of times. Um, so for them, there was no other option. They, they, they felt they felt the federal government wasn't hearing what they were saying. So that led to the creation of 
the CSA, the Confederate States of America, and then the lobbying of their fellow constituent Southern states began to like some of the states held off and say like ta- Texas and then let's see what happens. But as yeah. they saw it, they started coming into the fold because they saw no other option either at that point. Interesting. So wh- when, when was this, when, when, when did that, when did the Confederacy come about? What year was that in? Um, it, well, as I said, um, South Carolina uh, succeeded first in December, like 20th, 1860. So the Confederacy okay, really started so, 1861 mm-hmm. um, is when they started to really become a cohesive political entity. Just on the cusp of the war then, wasn't yep. it? So, yeah. Yep. And, then, right, right about this one. and then when war, when war was declared, other states joined the Confederacy afterwards. And they're kind of like in waves. Got you. But, yes. Um, and so South Carolina led the way, unfortunately. They were the first ones to break away. I've actually been to Charleston, South Carolina, um, and toured Fort Sumter and some of the other sites where um, slave auctions were conducted. And it's really poignant to be there because it's, 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 it's always important to face, face history, the good, bad, and the ugly. And I think it's so important that people should actually go to these sites, especially like that, because it really, it really is like hallowed ground. Like you really need to see this occurred. It's the reality of it. And it's really recognizing that. And that is a part of our history and put it in context for what occurred and, and what occurred as a consequence of that. Um, and they were the drivers of leading the charge for the breaking away from the United States and trying to create a CSA, Confederate States of America. Very interesting. So, I mean, I don't want to touch too much on on the actual war itself, but obviously, I think maybe you know, maybe we'll 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 do the the start of the war now, and then next, <laughs> the next episode we'll we'll go on to the actual war itself. So, sure. so it's April. Uh, 1861 isn't it that the first shots are fired where yep. are, are they fired in south carolina or yeah um yeah yep um the um fort sumter was a federal garrison at the time by federal mm-hmm. troops and they had been getting warned by the what wasn't the confederate yet but would become the confederate um landbound forces saying look it's like we succeeded we want we we want your facility. You need to evacuate. They kept refusing, refusing. So it really became a standoff. Um, mm-hmm. And they, at a certain point, what happened is it became a political. That was the flashpoint for everything because that standoff wasn't going anywhere, and it started putting a lot of pressure on the south, on the governor of South Carolina and the politicians there. Uh, okay, so what are we gonna, gonna do here? Because the Lincoln administration kept trying to resupply them to back them up, the garrison at Fort Sumter. But the South was like, are we going to allow this or are we going to finally do something? And it really kind of backed both parties into a corner from their various constituencies because nobody wanted to look weak and yeah. they wanted to stand by their convictions as well, say. So Lincoln was very much being a new pre- president. He was feeling the burden immediately about I already have a state that broke away. I have a I have a garrison under basically siege from the land with um, artillery batteries focused on them. They're being um, asked to capitulate and give up basically their artillery and everything in there. Can I allow that? Should I send ships and different things for different advisors? General Winfield Scott was the old war horse, as we'll say, from decades. He was the head commander of American military forces. Um, so there were a lot of perspectives about resupplying, pull them out. What should we do? What occurred then is basically Jefferson Davis and the Confederacy felt like we're going to have to pull the trigger l- literally here and take this because if we don't, then we have no leg to stand on for what we're trying to do. And we can't yeah. take the chance that Lin- Lin- Lincoln will move first and really resupply or or really force the point. So really, they ordered the first shots of shelling that occurred against Fort Sumter. And that, to Lincoln, was the point where he could then take decisive, try to take decisive action to order to bring it to an end. So, and that kind of transpired into his um, act calling for 75,000 militia to be raised immediately to help put down the insurrection because they never wanted to call it like a, a war 
per se, yeah. because they had different connotations and that that in itself insinuates the recognition of the South as its own entity. And he didn't want that to occur on a political sense. So really it kind of Got forced you. the South to begin firing on them. And that's what really started it. <laughs> So Lincoln, so Lincoln almost got his wish of not wanting to, you know, light the powder keg himself. Yep. Yeah, also was, every, yep. When the shells started flying into Fort Sumter, then it removed that from, from him. He didn't have to own that. Now what uh, what he did own was how to fix all that. And that became mm. four long, grueling years, of course. Yeah. Uh, because at first they thought it was going to be relatively quick. They, they really thought that it wasn't going to take long and this would be over. But that quickly spiraled out of control and became something much more involved and bloodier, of course. Yeah, I imagine when the other states start to join, you know, and the, the likes of that domino effect, like you said, when everyone starts to join. And, you know, is it 13 states? I think it is. Is it by yeah. the end? Yeah, All yeah. join um, and decide that they don't want to be part of the union anymore. <laughs> it's not going to be a quick a quick end to the war. Well, the, the insurrection, I suppose, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not going to go so good. And and there's all that, you know, In there's been a lot of talk over the decades and all the years about, well, the South had all the best military leaders. Early on, they absolutely had the benefit of a lot of strength early on from that from that famous class of West Point that decided to side with their individual states mm. um, and the Confederacy as a whole. But that really is a misnomer because there were a lot of fantastic Union commanders, both on a tactical level and bigger level, that would come into play um, and that were there all along. Um, and that's a that's kind of a bigger conversation all by itself. But a lot of the books for many years will say, oh, the South had all the advantages with man po- with their 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 generals and their core leaders and there were great talented individuals but it's it's misleading to really say that as a blanket statement though because the north had a lot of talent now robert e lee was ordered to be you know he was offered the command of the federal army to put down the insurrection by winfield scott and and basically lee was famously saying i can't take up arms against virginia so i have to resign my commission but, I suppose as, as as well, though, one of the problems that the South did have was all those generals and stuff. They all wanted what was best for their state as well, whereas the Union generals, it was for the Union. You know, it wasn't for Virginia, South Carolina. I'm here for Texas. You know, it was I'm here for America, United yep. States of America, and fighting for them, not for Texas, not for Virginia. So I imagine as well there was a lot of infighting and a lot of, well, I don't want my guys <laughs> – you know, I want I want my guys to take that, yeah, but your guys aren't here. You know, I imagine this way: politics, you know, war, <laughs> politics. <laughs> you're, you Nightmare. are spot on, Jake, because um, the nature of the Confederacy itself was also the weakness, its largest weakness. It was a loose conglomeration of Confederate states, which meant they were basically all out more for their individual good first, yeah. above the greater good of the Confederacy. And that would lead to the Confederate strategy loosely called the defensive offense, which basically meant that they were subjected to often. And this really put Jefferson Davis in a bad spot early on that he was at the whims, basically, of the governors of these states that he had to keep happy because they first and foremost wanted to protect their state, like you said. And that's what would plague them because – he was required then to make sure to as much as he could to support each state in their own um, in their own goals to protect themselves. And they all demanded the governors. I need more troops. I need this. I'm, you know, but they were always lax to send resources to other states so they could consolidate their manpower um, and make more decisive victories. Um, as we'll talk about, you know, Lee's always the one held up. You know, Lee won a lot of battles. Absolutely. But what people fail to talk about, he won those battles at horrific cost. He lost a bigger percentage of men for every battle he won than any other army, which is ironic because they could not afford to lose men to the rate yeah. he lost them. So Lee was a tactician, absolutely. I would challenge that he wasn't a great strategist because he was too myopic and like, hey, I need to win this battle. But what good is a battle when you're going to lose the entire war then you have to look at the whole picture and yeah he would 
he would achieve fantastic things at Ch- Chancellor's Bill and met many others, but look at the cost. Like Antietam was a big gamble right off the bat, lost horrific amounts of men and stuff. It didn't really achieve anything um, at, from a strategic standpoint. So that's something he just, he gambled over and over on these big strikes and these, um, and these pushes into the North and it just didn't work out. And it was, they were irre- irreplaceable, irreplaceable. And so were his, subordinate commanders when he lost um stonewall jackson um from friendly fire that was an irreplaceable loss because jackson was probably the finest tactical com- commander he the south had um but that was a loss they couldn't replace because their manpower on every tier was subservient by far to the north that just kept amping up their 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 officer corps they kept amping up their training they kept amping up their men they, they could just easily replace the losses that the South would be devastated on. And they started off the war a deficit with their um, their command staff and every army anyways, the South did. They never had enough chiefs of staff and, and staff officers to really execute orders correctly, which led to a lot of disconnect and lost orders and things being misconstrued. It just became a mess, for, and it got worse as the war went. So that did not help matters either. So there's just a lot involved in in the evolution of the armies from the top down on both sides. Fascinating. Michael, I think we'll leave it there for today. Um, In the next episode, we will come back and discuss the war from a military standpoint. You know, I think we'll hit, you know, key features in in each sort of area as well. You know, the the big hitting points, (laughs) as you will. But Michael, before before we go, um, you have wrote a book. So I'm going to hand the floor to you for you to to promote your book what it is where people can find it you know and and etc etc so michael the floor is yours excellent thank you um yes it's a short book as well as they're called 50 pages or so and it's about work i've done on byzantium the book is called byzantium's twilight strategic failures that crushed an empire it is available on amazon um and it's available as a kindle download or a softback book and in this I, i i I present information as I've gathered it that really speaks to that Byzantium was really destined to collapse long before Manzikert occurred in 1071. And I lay I lay out the case that it really stemmed from three factors. One, Justinian the first wars that he prosecuted to expand the empire to the biggest size it would ever be, that that was really in the long term beyond their capability as a empire. To the financial cost of basically building up the infrastructure of Byzantium was crippling to the economy. And really, it was unsustainable. It nearly bankrupted Byzantium, even by the reign of Justinian the, the I. There would be other peaks, and like Basil II and other emperors would, would bring some glory back, but they never were to the size that it was under Justinian, um, both in, in um, opulence with the buildings, the Hagia Sophia that was rebuilt after the earthquake of Justinian's plague, as it's called, it devastated the population. They were able to rebuild, but it laterally drained the treasury. And then the third thing is I talk about how the grand strategy of the Byzantine Empire was severely deficient in combating rising powers that basically chipped away and just ate it up, and they weren't properly able to set up or really, in a lot of ways, kind of turned a blind eye to the fact of rising powers like Islamic armies that were growing out of Saudi Arabia and expanding over decades and hundreds of years, that they really had no cohesive strategy in combating that, which would lead to their eventual downfall as well. So yes, they would survive almost a thousand years from their creation when the Western Roman Empire fell. But my contention in this work is that the foundations, I, as I say, the cracks in the foundation really occurred early on with Justinian really kind of being the cause of that, that he brought great opulence and territorial expansion. But what was the true cost? What was the really cost to the longevity of the empire? And uh, that's what I talk about in the uh, book, actually. So it's a tight 50 pages, but it's really engaging. A lot of research in there, a lot of great information about the economic transitions, the major campaigns and wars of expansion 
as well as the buildings, uh, the building campaigns and things that how they all tie back to really leading to the collapse of Byzantium, how it really undermined its longevity in the long run. So I'll link that in the description as well, Michael. So if anyone if anyone does want a copy of that, that'll be in the description and it'll take you to uh, to the book page. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure having you back on. And I Thank will you get you on very shortly again for the next podcast. And hopefully, fingers crossed, I will see you in Edinburgh very, very shortly. That'd be great. On that as well, that yes. we can make something happen there. Because obviously Perfect. you're coming over. Thank you once again for joining me, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for listening, downloading, etc. This will also be on YouTube as well. So if you are a fan of watching a blank screen on YouTube, <laughs> then this is your this is your time. But no, thank you, everyone, for the your continued support. Michael, an absolute pleasure. We'll see you on the next one. Cheerio. Sounds great. Thank you.